Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you an interview from the archives. This is an audio only interview I did with Dr. Matt McKay, a psychologist who had the experience of communicating with his son after his death through channeled writing. And Dr. McKay shares with us his own story of how he was totally skeptical about the existence of an afterlife until this happened for him and how he ended up writing a book along with his son, Jordan, who channeled messages for him to be in the book. I find it fascinating. I love stories like this. And so I hope you will too. So stay tuned for that in just a moment. Make sure you subscribe to the channel down below and also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen. And go to EOLuniversity.com slash support if you're able to make a small financial contribution to help keep this channel and the podcast on the air. So now we'll uh, get started with the interview with Matt McKay. I'm welcoming Dr. Matthew McKay who is a clinical psychologist and a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. He has explored spiritual and afterlife issues in three books, including Seeking Jordan, about after-death communications from his son who was murdered. And you can learn more about the book and Dr. McKay's work at seekingjordan.com. So Dr. McKay, Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I was hoping we could get started by just having you tell us a little bit more about your story and the journey that you've been on. I know that you're a clinical psychologist, and um, I'm wondering if uh, if you could tell us if if the the death in your son uh, of your son played a role in shifting your focus a little bit in your work, and just just talk about that. It did shift my focus tremendously. I, I think, uh, just to give a little bit of background, um, some years before Jordan died, I mean, I'd, I'd started out really as, you know, a, a scientist, somebody who does a lot of uh, research on psychological processes and therapy processes, and I um, was essentially an agnostic. I didn't have really much belief in anything. Uh, grew up Catholic and had kind of lost uh, an interest in that view of, of life and uh, spirituality. And but I came across a book uh, by Michael Newton, a Journey of Souls. And Newton was uh, a psychologist like me, and uh, a behavioral therapist, and also a hypno hypnotherapist. All the things that are similar to my own work. And uh, and yet he had had this extraordinary discovery, uh, really accidentally of uh, learning how to use a hypnotic induction to help people uh, enter uh, memories of the life between lives. And it was a very powerful book and had a lot of impact on me personally, and it began to change my cosmology and my, my view of what uh, spirituality is. And I learned to do life between life um, inductions and I uh, did it just not professionally but with people I loved and cared for and and uh, gave them an opportunity to kind of look at the at the spirit world and uh, also I had gotten very interested in Alan Botkin's work who wrote a book called Indu induced after death communication and he again is a psychologist like myself and he had accidentally discovered a small variant of a of a technique called EMDR, eye movement, uh, desensitization and reprocessing, which I used to treat trauma as well. And uh, But he had found a small variant that allowed him to help his patients with enormous uh, grief uh, and loss to actually make contact with the other side. So those were things that were happening before Jordan died. After he died, my my focus really shifted dramatically to wanting to really understand how I could make contact with him. Um, as you could imagine, when you lose someone that you love deeply, 
the, the big questions that you have are, well, is that does that soul still exist, and are they okay? And and I wanted to answer those questions, and then and then see if I could reestablish contact with Jordan. So that that became the the focus and the thrust of uh, and where I was headed spiritually after he died. And as a parent, I can just imagine um that the powerful longing to remain in contact with jordan and what a driving force that must have been for you it was uh consuming if if i could say that i just uh from the moment i learned of his death i i really set off on on this journey to try to reach him and first again just to see if he was okay uh, and then hopefully to be able to establish um, a chance to really talk to him, to have have a conversation, and uh, that ex- you know that took a while. That was that was probably a year or so after his death, where I finally learned how to have uh, channeled writing and uh, and how to really reach him and hear from him. So it's interesting that you had been working on some of these tools for a number of years before Jordan's death, um, probably having no idea whatsoever that they would become important to you personally in your own personal life. That's absolutely right. It was just being kind of captured by uh, Newton's discoveries and just fascinated by the kinds of descriptions of the afterlife uh, that People made. I mean, he he interviewed something like, or he interviewed, or he hypnotized something like seven thousand people before he wrote the the first book, and and the de- degree of agreement that people had about uh, what transpires after death and what the afterlife looks like, and the kinds of things that we do there, and the processes involved in transitioning through. Uh, the early stages of, uh, of post-death adjustment to the spirit world. All of that was amazing to me. And I, yeah, I just um, wanted to learn and gobble up as much as I could of that. Mm-hmm. I, I read Michael Newton's books as well and was um, oh, so fascinated uh, with uh, with everything that he learned from his experiences and also the fact that he, as a scientist, was a skeptic in the beginning. So he didn't come into this research um, believing in it at all, which made it all the more powerful for me. I don't know if it felt that way to you as well. That was exactly right. He was a guy who just stumbled into this. And uh, in the same way that Botkin stumbled into his discovery of induced after-death communication, I mean, these were people who uh, were using evidence-based therapies and uh, helping people with very kind of standard behavioral approaches to pain and trauma and loss and newton um, again just you know is a woman who had difficulty uh treating who, who had a problem that seemed like it was somewhat beyond the scope of her actual life uh on Earth at uh, this time, I uh, just decided to, you know, send her into a past life and see if he could find some evidence for what uh, might be troubling her now. And uh, and for reasons I think he wasn't entirely clear how it happened, she uh, popped out of her death in that last life and into the life between lives, and he was floored. Uh, so that that kind of surprise uh, and skepticism really um, was very con compelling for me. Mhm. Yes, I felt that way as well. And I I was wondering professionally um if you have felt any pushback from colleagues in your field who themselves are skeptics and have a hard time believing in any of this. Ha- have you experienced that? Yes. You know, I expected that. I certainly I have colleagues who are very open and embrace um the channel writing and and learning about the other side and and the, and the ability to communicate with the other side and I have colleagues that I don't even talk about we don't, we don't go there um, it's uh, all science all the time and 
what you can't prove doesn't exist uh, with some folks. And I, I respect and appreciate that because I was really one of those people mm-hmm. uh, in, earlier in my career. And I, uh, you know, the, you can't push the river. You, you let those folks um, hold on to their perspectives and um, the ones that can embrace a deeper spirituality um, enjoy enjoy those relationships as well so i'm i i haven't felt persecuted and i don't i don't for example at the graduate school i teach where i teach i don't advertise that i do channel writing although some of my students know about it simply because they've googled me and they can see you know what i've written um, but i don't i don't make it a part of the work or what i teach i focus on evidence-based therapies and research tested treatments uh, but of course this is a very big part of my life and my work and i will share it with somebody who wants to know mm-hmm. well it is interesting how it's really <clears throat> the experiences of our lives that end up pushing us to grow in certain ways and we can't create that <laughs> for another person we can't create that for our colleagues or help them get there it will be their own life experiences that move them in one direction or another so um yeah, that's that's exa- how, exactly right that's how it exactly happens right. <laughs> and i don't um i don't want to uh, push people past where they are they're comfortable and and as you say pushing them doesn't get anywhere anyway so i'm i'm happy to wait uh, for those folks to catch up or to, and i certainly wouldn't wish the experiences i've had on anyone as a as a transfer transformational process it certainly has changed me but i would never want anyone to go through what i have so i'm happy to let them stay at whatever level of spiritual awareness they have yeah. You mentioned that it took quite a while for you to actually be able to make communication with Jordan. And um, what was what was that process like for you? What what did you go through during that time? Well, the process of making of actually connecting with him started with going to Chicago. I live uh, in the Bay Area and I went to Chicago to see Alan Botkin, who, as I'd said, had discovered a way of adapting EMDR to um, help people actually m- make contact uh, with loved ones they've lost. And so I um, went through that process with him, and um, I had the experience of hearing Jordan talk to me as if he was in the room. I mean, I, mean, I literally could hear his voice. He had very specific things to say to me, messages for his mom and he conveyed the two things that I had been desperate to know that first of all he the soul I knew as Jordan exists and and that he's he's happy he's he's in a good place and um, I later later learned a lot more about where he is and, and what his experiences have been but at the time I just had that first revelation of hearing his voice and hearing him tell me himself that he was okay. Um, and that was, I, I, I left there feeling lighter than I had since his death and, and a sense of hope. And, and yet, um, it was a one-way conversation. It was this process that someone else mediated and, and, and managed and, that I passively experienced and heard his voice, but I had no way of really conversing with him or asking questions and ha- having a real conversation. So that that became, uh, well, I was very grateful for that experience, hugely grateful uh, to Alan for that. But I also wanted to go beyond it. And so I began uh, working with uh, Ralph Messner. He's a psychologist who also does after-death communication work. Um, and Metzner taught me how to do channeled or automatic writing, which turned out to be, first of all, remarkably easy. I hesitate to say that, but but it is. Uh, and I've taught it to lots and lots of people, and 
the vast majority of people are able to start automatic writing at the first try. They, I mean, the channel writing, they, they are able to do it um, even, even at the first attempt. So it would appear that it is relatively easy to learn. And for me, it felt very natural. And um, the process allowed me to actually begin to have conversations with Jordan, to ask questions, to get answers, to uh, follow up on those questions with others, and, and, and for the conversation to go very deeply into the nature of his experience, uh, what the afterlife is about, and also what our life here is about. Uh, you know, he has knowledge that I certainly don't have. He has the perspective of being able to recall many, many, many lifetimes and the things he's learned both uh, on Earth and um, in the spirit world. So that that was a huge shift for me, the, the, be, the beginning of, of those conversations. Mm-hmm. Wow. That, that sounds amazing. Like that uh, it just opened up an entire world to you um, that that you hadn't really experienced before. It opened up a world that was so beyond anything I could understand or or really initially grasp. Uh, Although in some ways the world Jordan describes is not fundamentally different from what Newton describes, but he has so much more detail about it and also, you know, kind of, a, should I say, a, a philosophical perspective or a, or a, um, a way of describing, um, you know, what, what the actual, what, you know, what is our purpose as, uh, as not just souls, but as little units of consciousness? Uh, why do we exist? What's the, what is the, and how how does that fit into this bigger question of of God or the divine or higher power, or whatever? How, you know, how does our little individual consciousness fit into that? And he's really um, gone deeply into that cosmology, and it's, I'm just so grateful for that. It's been um, it's felt like it's opened a world that I would never have had access to. And I'm assuming um, because I know Jordan was 23 at the time of his death, so it sounds as though this is not necessarily knowledge or wisdom that he possessed when he was in physical form on the planet but this is all wisdom that um that his soul possesses that he's able to see and experience um on the other side is that is that correct that's exactly right i I mean certainly jordan is very recognizable in these conversations his his humor and his way of communicating and uh, his personality uh, that, you know, I mean, we have a, a personality that's partly just marked by our, or, or shaped by our human body, our nervous system, and 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 so forth. But, uh, but our personality also, to some extent, is, is eternal, and, and who we are as souls is pretty recognizable, and I can certainly feel and appreciate the, the Jordanness that comes through to me. But the knowledge he has, which now he has access to all the knowledge of his past lives, including lives that we've shared together, um, and, and a kind of a scope, an arc of um, his development as a soul, and to some extent the ways that we've developed together over a number of past lives, all of that uh, knowledge is so beyond anything I could imagine or that he had when he was here so it yeah it's um it's opened up something vast even though if it's still very recognizable as jordan hmm. would you um matt would you share some of the just some of the wisdom that you've learned from jordan maybe about how he talks about why we're here our purpose to be embodied here on on the planet yeah i mean one of the things he talks about is, you know, the, the ultimate purpose of incarnating. Why why do we do that? Um, and, you know, the divine or God or all it is, however we want to describe it, does break up and create individual bits of consciousness, the, the, the souls that go out and incarnate. And 
um, and the purpose is for uh, the souls to to learn. That's that's our whole function. Uh, we're, we're little learning machines. Uh, you might think about it as um, bees in a hive. We leave we leave the hive and go out and collect nectar, which is wisdom, experience, knowledge, awareness, and bring that back to the whole. And some of the things that are very different about the the cosmology that Jordan describes from my experience growing up as a Catholic is that. First of all, God, the whole divine, whatever it is we want to call it, is not perfect. It continues to evolve. And and the evolution of the divine goes on forever. It, it continues to evolve, grow, learn, and make more and more perfect and more beautiful universes in which to do that learning. And um, so the individual souls... Our function is is to help in that process, to go out and interact in these physical universes and dimensions, uh, and gather wisdom and knowledge uh, through, you know, m- many, many, many lifetimes and many, many choices and the outcomes of those choices, and all of that ultimately contributes to the wisdom and knowledge of all of, of the divine. So we're bringing that back to the hive, and the hive. Uh, the divine is enriched, grows, and develops from all of our individual experience. So that's so it's very different from uh, the cosmologies I grew up with. So the, the God continues to evolve, and that we're all essentially little parts of God. Um, the other thing that's different is that we are not here to be judged. We're not here to prove ourselves worthy of heaven. Um, that just doesn't happen. Um, we are simply here on a mission to learn, to grow, to evolve, and to help the divine learn, grow, and evolve. So the idea that uh, we're going to show up and end up being judged worthy or unworthy and uh, find ourselves going down the grease slide to hell or uh, ascended to, to sing with the angels, those, those ideas don't fit at all with what he describes, or for that matter, what Michael Newton and many other people and mediums describe. So uh, so that I had to kind of let go of any of that notion um, as Jordan talks about our purpose. And, and the thing that's so lovely about about the way he describes uh, our purpose here is that we really are have, have kind of a sacred mission. We're, we're doing something really important. We're not just here to, to prove ourselves worthy or to you know earn some station in heaven. Uh, we're here to help the divine move toward perfection. Uh, in in each of us in our own way are, is doing that so it's a very beautiful mission and all the pain that we suffer is absolutely necessary we come here for pain it's the other thing he talks about uh, we're not here to escape pain we're not here to uh, you know kind of in a Buddhist way of thinking that we're, we're just going to give up attachments to things and finally reach a point of where, where we no longer are attached and therefore no longer vulnerable to pain and loss um, but but we're here actually to, to, we've come to a place where, where there is a great deal of pain, and that pain is a necessary part of the process of learning because you 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 learn by making choices and then finding out what happens. And, and 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 our fundamental job here is to learn how to love in the face of pain. And and you can't do that in the afterlife. You can't do that in the spirit world. Love is is effortless, really. We are surrounded by love. Is the, love is the medium through which we communicate. It's almost the air that we breathe, if you can, if you will, in the afterlife. So it's effortless. It's, it's um, it, but here it requires enormous effort. Love, we have to do that in the face of unbelievable barriers, psychological, emotional barriers, uh, losses, uh, and uh, hurts. So learning to love here is an extraordinary thing that actually isn't possible in the afterlife and in the spirit world. And we take this knowledge back with us. Mm, that's beautiful. And um, I, I have the same sense that you're describing that this is in many ways, it's a planet of suffering. It's a planet that has a cycle of life and death. Everything is born and then eventually dies. And so suffering is built into life on this planet. And it makes sense that we as souls 
come here specifically for that reason because exactly because the soul can't experience birth or death um, without being in human form in order to in order to ex experience those two great transitions that happen to the physical form right and and there are lots of planets where souls incarnate and um, my understanding is this is one of the most difficult ones it's a kind of an acquired taste coming to to Earth, uh, because it's a very dense pl uh, planet, and uh, and there is a great deal of pain here, and yet that pain allows us to learn and grow in a way that would not be possible without it. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, I'm wondering, did Jordan give you a sense at all that his own death was somehow um, part of a greater plan? or um, an important event that happened for him and for you? Well, I think it would be really narcissistic of me to say that Jordan's death was planned so that I could, you know, do some of this work with him. I, I mean, I mean, his, my understanding is that his death was something that was known and agreed to by all of us. That, mm -hmm. uh, that there were purposes to it that were probably m much vaster than I can possibly know or imagine, ways that it was going to touch and change lots of people, including lessons for Jordan himself and and our family. So there were, but but it is clear that that was something that was planned. My wife sometimes jokes and says, you know, when when we made that plan, she was. In the wherever celestial place we were, she was she was out of the room at the time. She never agreed to it, but I I do have to say that he's been quite clear that that was part of the part of the plan, and at least part of the plan was that he and I would do this work together, and it would only be possible to, to do it if we'd first establish a relationship, uh, and then uh, through that connection that I was. Well, we were able to hold on to each other across the divide and and find a way to actually work together. Uh, and we've done quite a bit together. I mean, we, um, we just, I mean, the the book Seeking Jordan is really you know comes from a lot of the channel writing I did, but just basically transcribing what he's told me. Uh, then we worked on a kind of a therapy method together, something called post trauma growth and wisdom groups, in which we're just starting to use now in a trauma clinic I I uh, direct and starting to test and and so that's an, another little project that we had together developing that the therapy process and now we're starting on on some something else he's wants to work on uh, something what he wants he calls the modern book of the dead which is how to navigate in the spirit world immediately after death and giving people some knowledge of how to do that. So we continue to have these projects and I don't know why exactly he just shows up with them and says, okay, the next thing we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always kind of uh, humbled and taken aback almost like, really, you want to do another thing? Okay, I'm, I'm game. Well, it sounds so powerful, and it sounds as though you and Jordan together have been able to help a lot of people through through these projects that you're doing. I hope so. I think that, you know, I get letters from people saying what his words have meant to them, and, and I feel like I'm just a, kind of an instrument to bring bring that to people, but it seems like it resonates with with some people and and gives them hope and some healing when they face you know just just terrible losses so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad to be part of that well i know um at the uh, afterlife conference you're going to be talking a bit about how you help others um learn how to communicate with those on the other side and so i was a little curious about how you do that and what um what process you teach people yeah well it it, it does turn out uh, and it, that grieving i think changes fundamentally when you're not when when the, when the grief is no longer for, for the the loss of that soul of that of that person of that of that relationship, 
but simply the loss of the physical presence of that person, that soul, that relationship. It really changes grief when you know that 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 person, that soul, that 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 entity continues to exist, and that you can talk to that soul any time you want. That 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 relationship is there. That that soul is just a thought away. Just merely thinking of them begins to open the channel, and that there are very simple ways of beginning the conversation. Once and once a person knows that and knows how to do it, it does change grief. Um, certainly, we continue to miss. I certainly miss Jordan's physical self and his sound of his laughter and and the and the chance to sit and gaze at him and have a conversation and hug him and and watch him move through the world and grow and evolve. all that stuff I can't do and I I feel that loss very much but I but on the other hand I don't have the loss of Jordan he's still with me and and that soul that he is is around is supporting me is helping me in all kinds of ways and I feel his his presence when I need him and his wisdom when I need it. So those things make grief so much more bearable. And so that's you know what I've been doing uh trying to show people how to how to make that kind of contact and how to reliably um create conversations uh, with those they love on the other side. So that so essentially um channel writing is is easy as i said i mean usually uh, it it involves just you know getting yourself in a place where you feel grounded and being, being centered in some way uh, i usually when i'm doing channel writing i usually sit at a desk that my parents gave me when i was young and it's you know it's a it's something that anchors me to my past and my sense of self. Um, so having a place where you feel grounded is is useful, and um, and it's, and I I also also encourage people to have a physical object that connects them to the loved one on the other side, something that that was given to them by that soul or uh, that 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 person once owned. Uh, and so, again, a physical object. For, for me, it's just a little uh, business card that Jordan had p- printed up when he was in high school. And it said, uh, Jordan McKay, uh, CEO, uh, Omega Technologies. And, and there was no Omega Technologies. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was uh, something he uh, printed up so they could get into trade shows and get a lot of free stuff, you know, at these at these big tech, uh, tech uh, conventions uh, that we often have in the Bay Area. And, but it just reminds me of his humor and his audacity, and so I, I love to just to have that, and 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 so I, I that that's my little um, link, a physical link uh, that I use. Um, I have then, to say I love that he chose the name Omega. <laughs> that seems very <laughs> significant to me. <laughs> it, it is interesting, isn't it? I, I, yeah, maybe there was a little prescience there uh, on his part. Kind of knew where things were heading, so um, yeah. and then I I encourage people to use some form of eye fixation. Uh, candles work great, um, and if you can get a candle that has a base that appeals to you, it just somehow feels aesthetic or interesting. I have a candle that my daughter gave me. It's uh, it's a uh, glass. Uh, mask uh, that uh, she got in Mexico and it, and the candle burns behind it and I can see it flickering behind the blue glass mask and that you know it just doesn't matter but having you know what exactly uh, how exactly the candle is set up it just matters to have something you can hold your eyes on something that you focus your attention on and then um there's a you, you need some sort of process to become more receptive, and there are different ways to do that. I mean, at the conference, I'll I'll teach several different ways. One involves 
sort of a uh, self-hypnosis that will, can easily get you into a receptive state. Another involves uh, basic uh, Vipassana style meditation, focusing on the breath, just noticing the breath in and out. And uh, for me, I, I usually will count the breath. And also kind of quieting the mind. If thoughts show up, just notice the thought, but go back to focusing on the breath. It's just a very basic focusing meditation. Um, and there's a, a divination process I use that I learned from Ralph Metzner, too, that involves visualizing a kind of a, a bright white star, just a, just a short space above your the crown of your head and allowing that to expand and and that that light and that and that ex, um, expanding star or orb of, of of light becomes the opening of the channel. But you literally visualize the opening of the channel between yourself and the uh, and the uh, afterlife. And so those are those are things that you do in in preparation for channeled or or uh, automatic writing. You have to get yourself receptive. And then you, you certainly simply hold a, the uh, awareness of that soul and your love of that soul and and allow that to continue to open the channel and and the intention of connecting and and conversing with that soul. It's just it's part of what opens and, and holds the channel open. And of course, it's automatic writing, so... Uh, Writing is involved in it, and it's, so it's helpful to have your own notebook. That's something special that you uh, do all of your writing in, and uh, and you start the process by simply writing the first question, whatever it might be. Um, and and now comes um, the kind of a crucial part of automatic or channeled writing. Um, you kind of wait for words to form in your mind. You wait for the, that first word or first very, usually a very short phrase. And whatever it is, whatever the word is, whatever the phrase is, you just write it down. You don't judge it. You don't evaluate it. You don't just say, what the heck is that? You know, Just write it down and then wait for that phrase to finish or turn into a sentence. After a while, more words will come and it'll finish the sentence and then if you wait a little longer there may be more sentences in the beginning usually the, the things that show up are very brief they're, they're just a few words or phrases and answers to questions and it becomes more elaborate as you get used to it and as the channel becomes stronger and more easily opened and held open but that but in that moment of course is this sense of doubt you know you start hearing words in your mind you start be, becoming aware of of the, of the words as they start to flow, and the, and the, and the, and the thought inevitably is, I'm making this up, or this is this is not anything real. This is just me. Uh, and so you have to you have to live with a certain amount of doubt. And so the, to, to do automatic writing, you have to hold that doubt, but but not let it paralyze you. It, it's there. It will inevitably show up. Sometimes I'm in the middle of downloading just amazingly complicated things, and I'll be thinking. You know where does this come from, and I'll be amazed. And, and some, other, and right next to it is the thought, "Well, you're just, you know, this is hokum. You know, <laughs> you're you're just cooking this up." And so, but we have to be able to hold that doubt, but not let it swamp us and and defeat the process. Um, so, so that's the, the that's the the part that I think is most challenging is to listen, simply write what you hear. What you get, what, you're, what shows up in your mind, and then um, not try to push away the doubt because that's not going to work either. But simply allow it to be there while you're while you're doing what you're doing. Hmm. And it, that, I'm glad you mentioned doubt because that was going to be <clears throat> my next question because I can imagine that. And it seems like the doubt is part and parcel of our human minds <laughs> that we you know in this human form when we experience something that's really beyond us beyond our understanding and our ability to explain it it's normal for us to have those that the doubt and uncertainty and that in some ways 
it, it seems to me the doubt almost almost proves to me how incredible the experience really is, how amazing this experience really is, that the mind is struggling, struggling to believe it and struggling to grasp it. It, it is, um, in some ways, the doubt is an index of just how um, unusual and meaningful um, channel writing can be. The things that, I mean, I, mean, I guess one way of thinking about it for me is that over time I feel like I've gotten so much wisdom from Jordan and so much help and I and I have a very strong feeling that this this is wisdom that was not in me that this was something uh, you know when I you know not not any individual session or conversation but over time I have a sense of having been given a lot that was um, was kind of beyond what I already knew or thought or expected and i so i've had i've had this sense of having a, a real companion and support and a soul who, who who's still with me and supports me and and that that and 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 the realness of that has grown as i've continue to do the channel writing it, it feels like that that sense is stronger and stronger there's also something that happens for people who do channel writing is you you often get confirmatory experiences and they come in different ways you know sometimes um i'll have a question or concern in regard to jordan and and a and a friend will have a dream in which he answers my question via that dream uh, mm. Literally, a friend will have a dream that says, and the friend will say to me, "I had this dream, and, and Jordan showed up, and he said, this is he wants you to know this.' And literally, he will give information to other people uh, for me." Um, another thing that was very helpful in terms of confirmatory experiences is um, working with mediums. So I went to see Austin Wells, who's a wonderful medium and uh, um, extraordinary. Uh, uh, person and uh, has great, you know, ability to connect to the other side. Well, anyway, I, I went uh, first encounter with her. Uh, she didn't really know who I was or anything at all, but she her her response was, "Oh, uh, you're writing a, a book with your deceased son." I mean, that was like, I, I mean, I think five or six people in the world knew that, and she was definitely not one of them. And I was like, "Oh my God, this is this is the real deal." And um, but but later I went to see her very deliberately. Actually, actually at Jordan's behest, he said, "Well, I want you to go down and see her because the last chapter of the book is something that um, you're not going to get it until you hear it from her through me. I, it, it, you're not going to even think to ask the questions that are going to get you to the to this chapter. So let's 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 do it that way." So I went to see her, and and she's. Of course, again, has no knowledge of the book other than what she told me before that I was writing this book. And then she just lays out all the chapters. She says, well, all right, the first five chapters are about this, this, and this. And then all the rest of the chapters are Jordan dictating essentially to you about um, the nature of the afterlife. And then she says in the last chapter uh, that Jordan wants you to write is about the, co the con confluence of spirituality and science and uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and how they can join up. And never would have occurred to me in a million years to write a chapter on that and uh, clearly I needed somebody to say that from the outside because I would I've never have asked that question of Jordan and uh, and so again that was a confirmatory experience I'm I'm getting information from her that wouldn't be possible unless he was also giving her information uh, and um, and so I've had quite a few of those kinds of experiences that have helped strengthen me in my belief that Jordan is really talking to me through channel writing. But but the doubt never totally goes away. It, it's something we just have to hold and live with, and and not try to suppress. It's just it's just going to show up. So we have to do it, do this work, connect to souls on the other side. And still have those moments of oh my gosh, what is this? And I do think that doubt is it's one of our companions on the entire spiritual journey for any of us, you know, going 
going off in this attempt to deepen ourselves and and broaden ourselves in our wisdom and knowledge, I think doubt is always a companion. Yeah, but one of the exactly, and yet, when people learn how to do channeled writing, it, to me, it just feels so. I mean, there's just this, this deep sense of, of gratitude, really, that I have when I can see someone doing this and and how it changes their grief, how it changes their whole perception of loss, uh, of of what um, uh, that, and and they recognize that we don't lose anybody. We're all in the circle of love. The, the, no, we have never lost anyone. They are there. They remain part of our lives. That that, li- that love continues as actively and and, str- and as strongly as ever. In fact, in some ways, more uh, people on the other side actually, in some ways, have the capacity to provide more support because they're not hampered by a limbic and nervous system <laughs> that j- that just uh, you know gets in the way sometimes of our ability to f- fully express love. So uh, the uh, the truth of that when it becomes clear um, really changes the sense of what death is and 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 turns loss into something very different it turns it into actually uh, on some level an opportunity to have a ve- have the same love expressed in the same relationship and the same love but expressed in different ways um, so i and we're all held. We're all held by the people on the other side. And just just getting to know that, uh, and not feeling alone here, and and being able to continue the conversations that we thought only possible in life, uh, and and while embodied, to be able to continue those mm. is very very uh, beautiful. Yes, that that's very beautiful. I I was wondering if you have any sense, I've been told by mediums in the past that sometimes when people are acutely grieving right after the death of a loved one, they may not be able to connect with that loved one on the other side because um, the energy of grief is so dense and that it's um, difficult for those in, in that state to even hear the communication or receive it. Do you have any understanding of that? Yes, although it's, you know, I, I think um, we're talking about two things here. One, one is spontaneous contact, and <clears throat> for um, a soul on the other side to make spontaneous contact, spontaneous meaning it's initiated by the soul on the other side. Of course, the soul here wants desperately to have that contact, but, it, when, you know, you know, but but when we, we experience it spontaneously in the form of, you know, uh, you know, Extraordinarily real and vivid dreams or visitations of various kinds. Um, I think those are are very difficult to. It's it's very difficult to be receptive to those when you're in this in state of profound grief. I mean, it, it disrupts the channel. It makes it very hard to receive. Uh, it's not impossible because people do, but it it makes it hard to receive. The other thing is that souls. Uh, departed souls have various degrees of experience and, uh, shall I say, expertise at initiating contact. Um, you know, the, some souls really don't know how to manifest themselves through energy or or electricity or 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 really how to manage or manipulate uh, dreams uh, of of a loved one here. So uh, some souls uh, really are not terribly adept at that you know they get on the other side they want to communicate but they but they, they have a kind of a, a staticky phone line let's say in terms of their ability to actually uh, make contact and so it's it, so it's, it can be a combination of things it can be the soul here who's who's you know dense with grief can't really can't really open because the their vibrational levels have have gotten so so slow and so dense that really not much can get through or it could be the soul on the other side is not terribly adept but with channeled writing it kind of cuts through some of those problems um, because um, the soul on the other side doesn't have to be um, adept at 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 managing or controlling energy in a a physical environment Um, all they have to do is be able to um, 
to communicate telepathically, which souls on the other side all can do. So um, it, it, it simply opens the channel to telepathic communication. And, and so that's much easier uh, than manipulating energy and, uh, and some of the other kinds of processes that, that happen when, when there are spontaneous um, uh, apparitions or uh, contacts. Um, and on the side of the of the of the soul here, um, the the act of intending to make contact tends to open the channel. So even though the person may be dense with grief and really uh, struggling, the the intention to open the channel and and going through a um, ritualistic process to open the channel um, often is sufficient. It, it, you know those so so it's easier to make contact through channel writing. Than any other means because it just it just simply um, bypasses some of the some of the uh, blocks that ordinarily occur. Hmm. So and and it sounds like maybe for someone who's in <clears throat> in the acute stages of grief, it can be helpful to have an assistant like you to participate in. Um, you know, in one of your workshops or to visit a medium or to have someone someone to help make that initial connection and to help create the channel in the first place. That's right. It, it really can help initially. <clears throat> once you learn how to do it, <clears throat> excuse me, once you learn how to do it, uh, it's yours. It's, it, it's something that isn't going to be forgotten. Uh, so, uh, Oftentimes, it's just necessary to have that first experience, and from then on, if you can manage the doubt and not be kind of paralyzed or overwhelmed by it, you can go on and have those experiences virtually any time you want. But it does help to have somebody kind of show you the way. In terms of mediums, I, I mean, I have great regard and respect for mediumship, and and it's been very helpful to me. Um, the one difficulty with mediums, this is not true, by the way, of Austin Wells. She will teach you how to how to have your own experience of making contact with the other side. But but the the, the usual experience with mediums is a passive one. The medium has all the knowledge of how to do that, and you are hoping, and they're the intermediary between you and your loved one. And so you are essentially um, they they are the the conduit. And of of all communication and information, and that can be extraordinarily valuable, and it makes a big difference. Uh, and I've had the experience of mediums being very, very convincing in their, uh, you know, reporting of what Jordan said, and uh, and and give, getting comfort from that. But in the end, if you if you want to have your own ability to have a conversation and to connect at will to connect when you need to and want to um you have to go beyond traditional medium processes and and kind of learn how to do that yourself hmm. yes that that makes sense and so it sounds like that's really what you do in your workshops you're teaching people how to make that contact for themselves um but it sounds like your workshop might also be helpful for people who work with the grieving um, to teach them how to be teachers themselves in some yeah. ways to to share share this information with others. Yeah, because I'm in the workshop, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not just talking about how to connect to loved ones on the other side, but also how to connect to your higher self, you know, because there's a part of our soul that always remains in the spirit world the Atman part of our soul that always remains in the spirit world. Uh, in fact, everyone here on, on the, who are, is currently embodied or incarnated on this planet, part of our souls remain in the spirit world. So we are always on some level divided. We're, part of our soul energy is here. Part of it remains um, yeah, in the life between lives. So um, we can communicate to our higher self, to our the soul energy that remains in the spirit world that has access to a lot more wisdom and knowledge than we have here because we have amnesia for all of that. Uh, we can we can communicate with guides, certainly with loved ones, or we can communicate um, to the divine itself, to all. Um, and so we can actually direct our attention and our 
and our questions um, in different ways uh, and to different entities on the other side. And so, so channeling isn't just about channeling to the person you love and, and lost, but it, it it can be about channeling uh, uh, to to the divine, to our higher self, to guides, and so forth. So. Um, uh, we can really direct the questions where we want them to go, and that's one of the things I'm talking about in the in the uh, conference. And the other thing is, what you said is is important that uh, channeling is a healing tool, but it's not just a healing uh, tool for grief. Um, it's also helpful with, uh, with trauma, for example, to get to get the support of and the wisdom of our higher self or our guides. Uh, or the divine uh, through channeling. Uh, in some ways, you can think of channeling as just another form of prayer. Uh, when when we're directing our questions um, to the divine, uh, it really is essentially a form of prayer. And learning how to do that, uh, and getting some answers uh, from, uh, you know, in, in Buddhism we call it wise mind. You know. The, uh, the, the, and where that wisdom comes from may may reach all the way again to to all or to the divine, and so g- getting that knowledge uh, and wisdom can help tremendously with trauma. It gives us new new perspectives, uh, new ways of understanding our experience here, new ways of understanding the pain and what the and the purpose of pain. Uh, that all the pain we suffer actually has a purpose. It's not just fruitless and 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 something to be avoided, but it's something that teaches us deep lessons. Knowing that uh, can also uh, that that knowledge can also come from channeling uh, to uh, divine uh, sources. And emotional disorders is an, another area that uh, I think channeling can be helpful because um, I think one of the problems with how people really get in trouble sometimes emotionally is that. We just get into this struggle with pleasure and pain. It's all about, you know, our lives are all about trying to avoid pain and seek pleasure. And 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 we end up when our lives are focused on the pleasure pain agenda, uh, often very dysregulated because there's a lot of pain that we can't avoid, and we're spending our whole life trying to avoid the pain. And and trying to avoid pain is the royal road to emotional disorders. Uh, trying to trying to just and our whole focus is like oh I can't feel that I can't have that I gotta get rid of that experience, and that's and that's how we develop uh, emotional disorders, and um, and instead what channeling can do is is offer a, a hugely different perspective that life isn't about avoiding pain and having pleasure but life is about uh, identifying our life purpose, um, our our mission here. And, and really getting clear about what our mission is and starting to make our choices and, and, and our um, uh, our values and, and, and the things we do in our life in alignment with that mission, with that purpose. And as life gets more, in, our life becomes more in alignment with our mission and purpose and, and the core values that we are here to learn how to enact, then emotional disorders uh, often begin to, to be less prominent, um, and so and so, channeling can be ultimately something that can provide a lot of help with a lot of problems. And grief is just one of them. Well, thank you so much for taking time out um, today to talk with me and sharing all of this, uh, all this wisdom and information. And thank you to Jordan for communicating through you too. And he, he's inspiring all of us. Um, through his through the wisdom he's shared with you and I'm really appreciative for that. Thank you very much, Karen. I hope you felt inspired by that interview with Dr. Matt McKay. Um, I was so inspired that I tried doing some channeled writing with my mom after her death and it was a really profound experience. So hopefully maybe this will be helpful to you in some way now or in the future. I'll be back next week with another interview. So until then, take care and be well.